Well, good afternoon. Um, let me introduce you to the keynote session of this afternoon on the theme of uh, innovations in digital health. My name is João Gabriel Silva. I'm the director of the University of Coimbra, and I have the privilege of sharing this session with this very distinguished set of guests, which I start by uh, thanking for the availability, the uh, being here with us and sharing your knowledge with uh, all the audience and the conference. Um, the theme has been changed, I think, for obvious reasons. Uh, digital systems are changing all aspects of life and certainly also healthcare. Um, as the digital and genetics revolutions converge with healthcare into the exciting new field of digital health, we are increasingly able to track, manage, and improve both our own health and that of our loved ones. Digital health is also helping to reduce inefficiencies in healthcare delivery, while at the same time streamlining access, improving quality, and making medicine more personalized and precise. The essential elements that are making digital health revolution a reality include wireless devices, hardware and software sensing technologies, the internet, social networking, mobile and body area networks. I find this idea of body area networks particularly interesting. Actually, we are a kind of a large network, and not just the blood, but many other networks in our body, so there's an, an additional one coming. Health information systems and genomic medicine. Digital health is probably the most important factor that will shape healthcare delivery in the years to come. Like any tool, uh, digital health is by itself neutral. It can either bring us closer to universal healthcare or deepen the divide between the rich and the destitute, the developed and the underdeveloped. We need to understand how to steer digital health to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being at all ages and in all regions of the world. Advances are needed in issues like choosing which technologies should and should not be used by national healthcare systems in regions at different levels of development on how to control complexity and keep costs under control. So, um, I hope that this session is going to give us a bit more insight in all these issues. Uh, we certainly are, or have very present, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations that call for universal health care. And we certainly have a lot of hope on this digital evolution uh, that we are witnessing. I will start uh, with asking each one of the, the members of the panel to make a presentation on his, his or her view on the subject. Then we'll have a short exchange of views among the members of the panel, and in the end, we will be open to questions from the audience uh, for our members of the panel to answer. So I'll start. Um, uh, I will present the, the members of the panel as they make their initial presentation. I start with the Minister of Health of Portugal, uh, my minister, is <laughs> um, going to make uh, a presentation. He's the Minister of Health of Portugal. He's a medical doctor. Um, he, was a professor, he is a professor of the National School of Public Health in Portugal, a former director of one of the largest hospitals in Portugal, so someone very knowledgeable in the field. Minister Adalberto Campos Fernandes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor João Gabriel. In, uh, I would like to present my very best compliments to the table, to our colleagues, to the dear. Uh, colleagues in the uh, assistance and to all participants in this uh, summit. First of all, I would like to share with you. I'm trying to. Okay. 
sharing with you some uh, the highlights of uh, the Portuguese health experience in this matter concerning the role of uh, IT and the digital transformation in healthcare systems. Portuguese uh, national health system is in tra transition through a profound digital transformation. In 2016, the government has approved a national strategy for health information ecosystem. We believe that a strategic approach of the role of technology and data policy in health systems must include topics like cybersecurity, interoperability, and semantics. This matter should be addressed by national policies and making a part of a global European Union strategy. Portugal has been chosen by the 27 member states of the European Union to lead the e-health action, a joint action from 2018 to 2021, to develop the areas of citizen-centered data, data usage and telehealth. We are proud of having one of the most advanced national health e-prescription and e-dispensation practices and a unique e-DEF e certification system. On telehealth, Portugal has created its own IT platform and it is now transforming normal PCs, personal computers, into telehealth units making this one of the largest, if not the largest, telehealth network in the country. In 2018, we will have a full centralized system for vaccination records in a nationwide basis, coordinated with a digital epidemiological surveillance system. One of the most critical projects concerns digital literacy of citizens which is being improved through the increased usage of IT tools. In line with principles of transparency, innovation, proximity and effectiveness, the government has implemented a new citizen-centred communication platform. This platform provides access to a wide range of information and online services provided by institutions of the Portuguese national health system. Also, we are promoting e-skills of health, either in professionals as well as more capacitated technicians. In all this process, we benefit from having a large e-health experience agency at a national level uh, that has special responsibilities in all matters concerning the improvement of interoperability standards as well in IT procurement. In fact, we believe that Portugal has now real conditions to become a leading nation in e-health. Finally, that's the reason why I show you this last slide. We believe that your presence in Coimbra next year in April will be a huge opportunity to reinforce our strong commitment with the European Union e-health agency strategy regarding a European Union scale and the vision. Thank you very much. Well, I now ask uh, Arno Berniat to make his presentation. He's the head of uh, Global Health and Healthcare Industries and System Initiative, member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum in Geneva, and he's going to make a um, presentation on the theme of why would the doctor want to see you now? Good question. Thank you very much. So it's about uh, healthcare transformation with, uh, with digital and, uh, and it's, uh, it could be very narrow or very, very broad and I'm going to take the broad approach if you don't mind uh, because we tend to associate uh, digital as it come, when it comes to healthcare to telemedicine and uh, but telemedicine is, a, is only the tip of the iceberg uh, if you think about what this could represent in the decades to come in terms of the market. At this point in time, we think telemedicine was give or take 300 million in sales in 2013, growing to 1.9 billion in 2018 and 3 billion uh, presumably before 2025. But that's again a very, very small definition of what uh, health uh, can be uh, when it comes to digital. Um, then I'm sure others 
uh, in the panel will talk about uh, telehospitals and clinics uh, as a way we can accelerate uh, clinical pathways with uh, discharge management, good triage, uh, remote radiology, diagnosis and pathology, not to even mention precision medicine. Uh, and, and that's where this market becomes a huge market. And uh, according to Calorama, this thing that is not telemedicine now, but is really telehealth, uh, could be as large as 25 billion before too long. So what, what are the mega trends that are uh, actually uh, driving that considerable change? Well, first thing, uh, we'll see in many geographies that insurers start to reimburse virtual visits. Uh, this is happening with United Healthcare, with Kaiser Permanente, and many more, just to name ones in the US. But it also corresponds to a need. Um, by 2025, shortage in the number of doctors in the US only will be between 60,000 and 90,000. And with the biggest worries in the field of pathology, radiology, primary care, and mental health. This huge deficit of doctors call for something else to be implemented that's going to leverage technology and digital. Patient. Virtual care in that context provides for convenience, increased access, better monitoring and treatment. Uh, that's the way daily lives get affected with wearable devices, uh, direct to consumer testing, including genomic testing, like we see company develop that service uh, with pioneering uh, company being 23andMe, and then all the access uh, to information online, uh, Web WebMD uh, being, being a prime example of that. Now, my comments so far have been very much ones of mature economies. Uh, I will make the point now that this is not a privilege of mature economies. In Nigeria alone, considering the primary care doctor density at the national level, in the average of three to four doctors per 10,000 inhabitants, to be compared to 34 in Germany, it would take 300 years to replicate the doctor density model we see in mature economies. That's not going to work. Something else needs to be invented, and the argument is that it will come from telehealth. Pandemics and epidemics, we had that discussion at lunchtime, uh, can be also benefiting from better, faster, more accurate clinical analysis, contact tracing, applying GPS technology to monitor, uh, to monitor the, uh, the pathways of travelers. All of that stands a chance to also help prepare for the next epidemics. Finally, and then we move into, from telehealth to research. Um, we've opened data networks in support of clinical research, large volumes of data sets for drug discovery to the extent they will be made open by way of policy or voluntarily, will provide holistic image of patients in support of clinical trials. That's precisely the belief, the belief of the Apple Research Kit. And that stands the chance to actually reduce dramatically the cost of doing research when it comes to bringing new drugs to market, which is part of the answer to the drug pricing debate, only part of the answer. So what needs to happen for that word to emerge? Well, point number one, policy making. Policy making will need to address numerous obstacles on the way, privacy being one of them, but also data ownership issues. Interestingly, uh, asking in the US, would doctors share the data of their patients? Two in three are still reluctant to do that. Now, if you ask patients, 75 to 80% would share their data on platforms meant to accelerate clinical research or to provide for disease management solutions. That's very telling. So changing the ownership of data is certainly part of that. Creating those models where 
Accessing data online is not a risk, a risk of being misinformed. Curation of that information is also very key. And also, this is where we move from triple aim to quadruple aim. What's in there for the doctor? In virtual medicine, the work of doctors should be simplified, not complexified. According to the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, 44% of doctors' time is spent in data entry, as opposed to 28% in patient interaction. So those regulations need to support the change, and there will be emergence of technology and solutions that will capture in a digital fashion using voice recognition the instruction from doctors. It creates again an additional market that I was not even telling about before. We need to make sure there is also regulations that are going to break the silos between borders. This is happening at, at the level of nations, but also in the, at the level of states. Uh, a number of state medical boards in the US make it difficult for doctors to practice telemedicine, especially interstate. Sometimes it involves a prior physical medical examination. Last but not least, everything has to be clinically proven. Like for everything in medicine, the digital health will happen on the basis of same clinical rigor with well-established randomized control studies. Virtual care could then reduce the cost and improve outcomes that matter to patients but should not break the bank. Happy to elaborate further during the question part of the panel. Thank you, thank you a lot. Now I'll pass the word to Carla Krivet. She is the Executive Vice President, Vice President Chief Exec Business Leader of Connected Care and Teleinformatics from Philips. Please. She's going to talk uh, to us about, uh, with a team interesting all, also one and challenging from illegible to immeasurable, the digitization of healthcare. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues. It's great to be here. When I thought about this speech, I thought it would be a good moment to actually take a quite critical view on digitalization of healthcare, because I really feel we are at a pivot point where we have to get this right. And let me start with a personal story. Recently, I supported my aunt in a battle against cancer. The amount of paper in the entire diagnostic and treatment system, the misunderstanding between different kind of caregivers in the hospital and outside, the confused message this patient received and we as a family, and worse, the wrong diagnosis and the not appropriate treatment was nothing short of horrifying. I had a very open discussion with the treating doctors afterwards, and I'm the first one who would totally agree that everybody in this business is there to save lives. Nobody goes out to make any mistakes. But the amount of miscommunication happened was really, really scary. In today's healthcare system, only 54% of the population trusts their national healthcare systems in over 70 countries. And one of the main reasons that is given for distrust is actually lack of connectivity between the players. 80% of medical errors are, uh, somehow involve miscommunication one way or the other. And only 32% of patients who are experiencing respiratory oncology or cardio issues had their electronic medical records, EMRs, been exchanged electronically. So while we are at a stage, and I'm at many conferences, where it's easy to get carried away by the advances of digital healthcare, and I'm the first one to say, 
we are at a great moment, right? For the first time, we have the chance to really address the widening gap between the demands of healthcare triggered by aging populations and more and more chronic diseases, and on the other hand, the cost burden, the non-affordability, and also the scarcity of qualified labor. But right now, with digital um, technology, we are really at the point where we can address it. But I also have to say that besides the tremendous progress being made in that field, and I'm responsible in one of the largest medtech companies for digitalizations and the progress we are making, I think sometimes we are fooling ourselves by taking input for output. So we measure big data and get carried away by big data. Honestly, when I talk to caregivers, if I talk to doctors, if I talk to nurses, and I spend a lot of time in customers, I've never heard a single one who told me, Carla, we need more big data, right? Or give us the next uh, artificial intelligence tool, please. What they are asking for is very much, give us back your, our time. Give us back the time to look after the patients. Take the burden, you mentioned, I know, of 44% admin work away from us. And if you come up with more data, make them useful and make them measurable. I'm running the world's largest patient monitoring organization. And there's not a single day, I would say, certainly not a single week, where not one of our researchers or customers or suppliers come up with new, new ideas of measurements to be shown on the patient monitor. Besides the vital signs we have right now, we talk about sleep data, which would be great, hemodynamic data, care stage data. And sometimes we are falling short of really saying what for. How is this impacting the workflow? How are we going to measure outcome? How are, is this going to help to reduce costs and make healthcare more affordable worldwide? There are, so to not to make it too negative, very positive examples. So Philips has a strong foothold in the ICU and in the OR, critical care areas, but we are moving more and more into the general ward. Why? Because 40% of the unanticipated death happen in the general ward. There is no continuous monitoring. And if you live in the United States, so I'm not talking developing countries, and you have a heart attack in a general ward, you have a chance of above 70% of dying. The good news is we can prevent that. There are early warning signs which you can track if you combine respiratory rates, temperature, other vital signs to alarm the caregivers before. And hospitals like the Lakeland Hospital in the US reduced cardiac arrest by 56% doing so. This is digital technology at work which is outcome-based, which is measurable. And the contracts we have go more and more in that direction that also require the industry to change their business model. Let's explore how we can adopt this forward-looking, really predictive way of data in three distinct areas. The first one is reduction of clinical errors. 30,000 people die each year in Germany alone due to medical errors. And even in developed nations around the world, this is such a leading cause of death that it's rivaling even the world's deadliest diseases. Consider a typical patient handoff between physicians. The types of errors um, around maybe forgetting a deadly allergy or a miscommunicated dose uh, can be fatal, and even more, they are avoidable. For instance, if electronic medical records are shared and are shown on the patient monitor and travel with the patients wherever they are, this is true output. This is something where you can see the effect. Second point, improving clinical outcomes. Everybody in the industry talks a lot about outcome-based care about improving clinical outcares and uh, about keeping our patients safe all the time. But many times, again, we talk about input, not output. 
and we reward that, we have to shift also the reimbursement system to focus more on the reward of measurable impact of mortality rates, of hospital-acquired infections, on first-time right diagnostics, and any number of other outcomes that truly present value-based care. When we talk about precision medicine, part of customizing healthcare for each patient must involve making use of all sources, including genomics, where we really, by pairing genomic data with diseased histology and patient phenotypes, caregivers are able to create a more complete and biomarker-informed diagnostic and therapeutic picture. The result? Information that can deeply empower caregivers and patients to make informed decisions. In the end, it will be always the caregiver, in our view, that makes a decision. But we can be so much better in preparing that decision, in joining all the different kind of data and make them usable and predictable. Last point, improving efficiency. Repeatable and fail-safe processes are key to productivity. But it's really the new advances about artificial intelligence and machine learning that will augment human expertise and trigger the most dramatic improvement in efficiency. Think about a patient like my aunt. 75 years old, cancer patient, uh, a long history. She was treated on an individual basis. If you would take all the data of women in the similar age in a, with a similar track record of her entire life with similar comorbidities, get genomics involved, you would have such a better picture. And the misses that happened in this real story would not happen. The digitalization of healthcare, like no other technology shift before, is also enabling better healthcare delivery outside the hospital, in nursing home, for GPs, and in the home. Mature connected care that incorporates AI, machine learning, augmented reality, and all the other cap capabilities the world still has to discover. But it's only if we integrate it and if we only if we really rigorously ask about the so what. How is it changing workflow? How is it triggering actions? Is it just information? Is it just data? Or is it something caregivers are willing to act upon because they understand it and they see that in the end it saves time and cost for them rather than increasing complexity? In the past, Caregivers' illegible handwriting could open patients up to significant risks. It led to inaccurate patient information and inappropriate doses or treatments. The impact of healthcare digitalization goes well beyond correcting handwriting or putting a patient's medical record into computer software just to store it. Most importantly, it offers the opportunity to really look into the future, to predict issues, and to trigger actions that, in the end, improve patient outcomes and save lives. But we must move from data to information, from information to insights, and finally, from insights to wisdom and to action. If we do, our loved ones, like my aunt, will not need to suffer because of miscommunication, unaligned treatment plans or imprecise diagnosis. <coughs> so let us all team up to create this wisdom. Let's work together to make the best decision about care and finally realizing the promise of digital health. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask uh, Elmar Nimersken, Deputy Head of Unit on Innovative and Personalized Medicine of the Health Directorate, of the Director General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, to take the word. is going to speak about the European Union action on digital transformation of health and care.
Okay, good afternoon. And I'm going to set my presentation into the context of the European Commission priorities, uh, where one of ten priorities of the European Commission is the digital single market. Um, so it's really at the heart of our policy work, and um, this strategy aims to open up digital opportunities for people and businesses and enhance Europe's position as a world leader in the digital economy and society. This digital single market strategy was put into place through a policy document from the European Commission, which was published in May 2015, and you have the reference there on the slide. Um, so it's really the goal overall is to make the U European single market fit for the digital age. And it's composed of th three pillars, as shown on the slide. So we have access, environment, and economy and society. After two years of having uh, published this communication, the European Commission took stock in May this year and published um, the so-called Digital Single Market Midterm Review, again with a reference on the slide. And that document assessed the progress made and proposed a new action on the digital transformation of health and care. And this proposal, with this proposal, we want to ensure that the digitization in health and care will benefit EU citizens, that is, provide them with better treatment, prevention, and early diagnosis of diseases, and at the same time ensure that we deliver more sustainable health and care systems across the European Union. In this context, it's interesting to look at some uh, survey results. So when asking citizens and health professionals in the European Union about their views on digitization of health and care, we find that really a majority of citizens wish to have uh, access to electronic uh, health records, but that only very few hospitals in actually allow citizens to do have that access. We have already heard uh, about e-prescriptions, but so far uh, this is really not yet widely available uh, in Europe. As for health professionals, and the exchange of uh, information, and again, we already heard it in the preceding presentation. This is something that is still happen, happening only to a small extent. Um, so we have, within the same country, we are approaching, it's around a third. But um, in Europe, we do actually have quite a, bit of, uh, quite a number of patients who seek treatment across borders, and there the electronic exchange of data is really very limited. On the other hand, as we also have already heard, there is actually a large willingness of citizens to share their data. Um, overall, seven in 10 would be willing to give their health and personal well-being data to others through a secure infrastructure. Of, not surprisingly, this willingness is mo highest uh, for the sharing of data with their doctor and uh, healthcare professional. But, even, but also for um, research, a number of people, 20% with public bodies and 14% with private bodies would be willing to share their data. <coughs> but um, the infrastructure to do that, as I've already said, is limited. Um, only 18% of citizens have used health and care services provided online without having to go to a hospital or doctor surgery in the last 12 months. And these only tools and services were mostly used in Estonia and Finland, both 49% and very least used in Malta. Now, coming back to the digital transformation of health and care, the text on the slide here actually is a quote from this mentioned midterm review communication. And you see that the European Commission plans to work along three pillars. First one is to discuss and present initiatives to improve citizens' secure access to electronic health records and the possibility to share it. Second pillar is to support a data infrastructure to advance research, disease prevention, and personalized health and care in key areas, including rare, infectious, and complex diseases. And the third pillar is about prevention and citizen empowerment, as well as quality and patient-centered care. The way forward will be to have actions from the European Commission where we have a clear EU added value, value 
where we can stimulate further cooperation on the three digital single market midterm review priorities for health for the benefit of citizens. And the tools we have at our hand are funding, so we have uh, research funding programs, funding through the uh, Connected Europe facility and others. Second pillar, what we can, the second tool we have is we can uh, improve legal implementation, we can propose new legislation, but very importantly, we can also work to coordinate, uh, help the coordination between member states. And we can cooperate, uh, support the cooperation between different players. On the way to the proposed communication, we have already achieved a number of milestones and there have been a few events and some more are to come. So just briefly, uh, in July, the health ministers held an informal exchange of views on e-health. At the same time, we launched a public consultation uh, in the context of this planned communication, and just last Thursday, this communication closed. And about an hour ago, I saw an email with some of the first results. Uh, so we have received almost 1,500 replies to this consultation, which is really quite a lot. And first results from this uh, analysis will be presented at this event happening in Tallinn for the moment, starting today. Uh, it's called Health in the Digital Society, Digital Society for Health. Um, several uh, commissioners will speak at that event, several director generals. And um, so that where we will have really a quite a thorough discussion on the planned uh, communication and the work surrounding it. You will be aware that uh, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe uh, is a new law which come, will come into force next uh, year. And um, there is a lot of questions on how can we exchange data in the health sector uh, in full compliance with this law. And what we will have uh, next week is a discussion, very quite technical discussion, um, to really see all, with stakeholders um, to um, discuss this matter with all the relevant experts. Our funding tool from the research side is uh, Horizon 2020 that I hope you have heard about. And um, there we will publish our next work program for the coming years at the end of this month. And within that program, we have a lot of initiatives and activities that support actually the work in this uh, to advance digitization of health and care. Um, the European health ministers under the leadership of the Estonian presidency are actively discussing on council conclusions this is a tool in the European policy framework where the relevant ministers come together uh, to um, really agree on measures uh, to take for them to take for invitations uh, to the Commission um, and also some joint invitations and that is actively uh, going on and they will adopt this at their uh, next meeting uh, in December. And then we hope to be able to come out with our communication before the end of the year. And to conclude, I just want to highlight that there's really political momentum behind this at the highest level. Um, our Commission President Juncker in his uh, State of the Union speech uh, in Strasbourg uh, in uh, September uh, talked about that we really set out to complete a digital single market through a new uh, also through a new industrial policy which will help our industry stay or become number one in digitization and uh, heads of state and government of Europe met uh, at the end of September uh, in Tallinn also um, and from that Tallinn summit on digitization of Europe um, the Prime Minister uh, Yuri Ratas uh, concluded that we should bring government and the public sector into the digital age and our primary focus should be on the areas such as mobility, health and energy. So there's clearly a lot of momentum also coming from the presidency and um, with that, uh, I thank you. Thank you. I would now uh, ask uh, Thomas Lauer, Global President of SAP, SAP Health, to uh, come to the floor. Thank you. He's going to speak about uh, on a theme that it is unleashing the power of digital a technologist view of data-driven innovation in healthcare. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A few words about SAP Health first. SAP Health is a global division of SAP, and it's the division responsible for bringing the power of digital technologies to the broader healthcare industry. 
including life sciences, medical devices, labs, providers, and payers as well. I feel very privileged to be among you today and also quite excited. I've been working at the intersection of technology, business, and strategy for the past 20 years to promote innovation, and I'm truly passionate about the potential impact of digital technologies in, in healthcare. Let's consider our daily lives for a second. Four examples. Take education. Consider that more than 25% of college students today are enrolled in at least one online course. Technology has changed the way we access and acquire knowledge. Consider relationships. Together with social media, we're more connected than ever. We can stay in touch with childhood friends, people we haven't seen for a long time. And here's a startling statistics for you. Over 90% of single adults in the US have tried online dating. I mean, good or sad, you be the judge. But it's quite remarkable. Labor, the way we work. Think about the productivity gains of tools like workflow automations, robotics, AI, and finally transportation, how we move. Take the example of Uber with over 44 million riders in 77 countries. When is the last time you hailed a cab? So the point is, technology has had an undeniable impact on our lives. And for the most part, it's made our lives easier. Well, at SAP, we're pretty lucky because we've been at the forefront of this change. And we've helped over 25 industry sectors navigate their own digital transformation. I could pick a lot of examples, but I'm going to highlight two, which for me truly highlight and ex exemplify the power of digital and what's to come. First, in Karlsruhe, SAP partnered with the city to implement a vast network of lampposts. We equipped these lampposts with sensors to monitor traffic and air emissions. And by connecting these lampposts as a network, we enabled the city to respond in real time to improve traffic and reduce pollution. Second example, we recently partnered with a company called NTT to build a solution that monitors biomedical signals and data from the driver, including posture. And we combine this to a GPS data location set. And as a result, you have a solution that allows you to monitor holistically safety around the journey, to recognize signal of the driver's fatigue, and potentially to address any type of threat uh, on the road proactively. So the point here through these partnerships is that digital technologies have matured to the point where they can start addressing meaningfully some very broad and serious issues in our societies, just through these two examples, pollution, air quality, safety. But let me ask you a question. Are we seeing the power, the transformative power of digital technologies in healthcare? And let's consider four statistics from the World Health Organization. First, one in six deaths is linked to cancer. Diabetes, over 400 million people suffer from diabetes globally. And an estimated 50% are left undiagnosed, 50%. Cardiovascular diseases represent the lead, leading cause of death, with over 17 million deaths in 2015. And finally, consider chronic diseases. Together, they represent seven out of the top 10 causes of death. So, sure, we're seeing good innovation in, in, in healthcare, good digital technologies coming in, being consumed, and everybody will point towards the digitization of the patient record through the EHR. It's a great step. It's a fundamental step for future progress. But we can agree that we haven't yet seen the full impact of digital in healthcare. And why is that? At SAP, we believe there are a couple of reasons, but I will highlight three specifically that are very pertinent to our topic today. As highlighted by my colleagues earlier today, fundamentally, even in the context of shift towards value-based care, the economics of our industry still rewards treatment. We're focusing on better diagnostic, better care delivery. And as a result, we've massively underinvested in wellness. We're fighting the fire as opposed to preventing it. This focus on treatment 
has resulted in an innovation that has been really focused on better devices, better tools, better hardware. But we haven't invested equally in software. And as a result, we end up across our industry with very immature IT technologies and infrastructure as it comes down to workflow education and data management. And this immaturity is clearly manifested in the fact that our tools are disconnected from an IT standpoint. Systems do not talk to each other. The data doesn't flow. And this disconnection in the context of an industry that's highly regulated with very sensitive data fundamentally limits collaboration tremendously. So what is the cost of these challenges on care, on quality of care for patients? And here I'm going to highlight for you a, um, an example that we can all relate to, cancer. Obviously, we're all touched by cancer directly or indirectly. And when you suffer from cancer, you would expect your doctor to be able to leverage large data sets inside his organization as well as external data, tumor registries, uh, clinical trials, to be able to get to the best informed possible decision about your care. Unfortunately, these decisions are far less data-driven most of the time. Consider that only 5% of cancer patients are enrolled in clinical trials. So as a result, physicians, oncologists, have had to extrapolate from narrow study findings and rely a lot on their experience. It's certainly a good start, but we can do much, much better. And at SAP Health, we participated um, on this fight to improve cancer treatment through digital technologies. And I will highlight for you the journey that we undertook. The journey starts with our friend at Charité, one of the largest university hospitals in Europe, where we built with Charité a fully integrated granular data sets of all the patients that Charité has ever treated. And we allowed a structured access to this data through an easy to use interface. And with the solution, the, the oncologist can basically query this internal data, local case history, to get to a more informed decision about the care of his patient. The journey continues with NCT in Heidelberg, where we leverage our technology to detect tumor markers in pathology reports and doctor's notes. So here, the step goes further. While sitting in front of the patient, the oncologist can actually access not only local data, but also external data through tumor registries to get to the best possible decision. Third, with the American Society of Clinical Oncology, we're helping ASCO power their CancerLink initiative. The CancerLink is basically a tool that combines clinical data from a very wide range, wide population of oncologists. At this stage, we've collected data from over 100 clinics, and the data set represents about 2 million lives. So with this step with ASCO, what we've done is we've engineered a network effect through very large data sets. And now, more recently, with the IGR, Institut Gustave Roussy in Paris, we are combining clinical and genomic data for about 300,000 patients. And this is just the beginning. We're absolutely pursuing the aspiration with IGR to extend those capabilities to a broader network of cancer research centers in, in Europe. So what are we seeing here? What am I trying to tell you? Here what you're seeing is essentially the power of a data-driven, network-driven strategy. You're seeing institutions like these elevate themselves beyond their own agenda in order to improve care globally. And at SAP Health, our division, we're, we're both thrilled and privileged because we can engage in similar journeys on many, many diseases and multiple patient-centric use cases. And so we, we regrouped with my team and we asked ourselves, okay, what can we extract from these journeys, from this capital of experience that can be applied more holistically to healthcare to maximize the impact of digital. And we came up with three observations, three lessons learned that I will share with you. The first one is about data, of course. And it's the notion of you have to break up the status quo by a commitment to data-driven decisions. And this starts really by recognizing and respecting data as a first-class asset. 
From there, build a, a, a data governance process, a consistent framework on how data will be collected, managed, and shared across your organizations. This is absolutely fundamental if you want to be able to increase, scale up the leveraging of data in a secure and consistent manner. Second, connect to all data, irrespective of the format or the source system. And this goes beyond the data that resides under the HIPAA umbrella. Pursue real-life evidence, patient-reported outcomes. Finally, democratize the data. Make it available across your organization so that you can foster a culture of data-driven decisions. The next observation, the data was the what, the technology is the how. And here the lessons that I would like to share is that, look, you don't have to rip and replace your current infrastructure. We've all spent a lot establishing an infrastructure that takes us to a certain point. But here if you want to go beyond, it's not about ripping it and replacing it. It's about leveraging and extending it through the adoption of new tools, cloud and big data solutions. But as you bring these new solutions into your environment, make sure they qualify against three criteria. First, they have to be open. They have to connect seamlessly to your current tools. Second, they have to be scalable. We all understand that leveraging the data is just at the very beginning, and data sets are growing exponentially, both in diversity as well as in size, fundamentally. And finally, prioritize systems and solutions that give you a chance to leverage the data in real time. And here I'm not just talking about grouping the data together, but also creating an insight that you can turn into action. Any type of latency in the steps that you need to engage into in order to leverage the data will reduce the value of this data for the benefit of the patient. So real time is absolutely critical. Final and last observation, and probably the most fundamental one, really at the heart of digital innovation. Put the patient at the center. Put the patient at the center. Start from the patient when you develop a new solution. Start from the problem and then re, you know, reverse engineer. It sounds obvious, but we haven't done this well at scale as an industry. Consider that there are 250,000 clinical or wellness apps globally, and only about 4%, 4.5%, if you want to be really generous, are used at scale. I mean, this is the proof that most of these applications haven't put the patient at the center when they were developed. So embrace patient-centric design principles. Engage the constituents, the patient, the support groups, families, friends, all layers of the clinical staff. And consider as well, you know, adjacent peripheral constituents that have an indirect participation into the care journey. So I'd like to conclude today on a quote from Mr. Jobs. This quote was included in his biography released in 2011. And it's important to remember the perspective that this man brings to our topic today. Here's a man who is widely recognized as one of the greatest technology innovators of our time. And at the same time, he was also a patient who suffered a very complex and deadly form of cancer a patient who went through a liver transplant. So his perspective is unique, and his words resonate, especially the word intersection. What it's telling us is that we need each other. True disruptive innovation from digital in healthcare will come from deeper collaboration models. And it is our collective challenge to really embrace this notion and engage into experiment pilot new collaboration models because our work together is not just about improving an industry, but fundamentally about saving lives at scale. At SAP Health, we're absolutely dedicated and committed to doing our part on this. And we are convinced that we can and will succeed if we do it truly together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, up to now in our panel, we've had political perspective, including ministers, European Union, technology, techn uh, the economic perspective, the, the providers, technology providers, uh, both more the, from the equipment side and the software side, but you certainly are missing one very important play, which is the pharmaceutical industry. And 
um, to finish the panel in the very best way possible, I would like to ask um, Stephen Hildeman to come to the floor. He is Global Chief Medical Officer, Head of Global Medical Affairs and Patient Safety at Merck, uh, and is going to talk about unlocking tomorrow's cures, digitization in the pharmaceutical industry. Please. Thank you. Before I start, uh, Carla, I would like to thank you for sharing a personal story of the battle of cancer from a relative's perspective. And this is something that will happen to more than a third of us in this room today during our lifetime, either as a relative or as a patient. So thank you for that. Dear Minister, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you in for inviting me to today's discussion of what we at Merck found to be one of the most fascinating and promising developments for the future of healthcare and societies, the innovations in digital health. For the purpose of today, I'd like to focus on three hypotheses for us to debate. Number one, progress in genomic medicine and digitization, digital health is explosive and unprecedented in the history of science. Both fields, molecular medicine and big data analysis, complement each other and open up doors to cure even the most severe diseases. And finally, we believe the pharmaceutical industry is uniquely positioned to contribute to global health if we accelerate our cultural change to deep partnerships with governments, payers, the device industry, the developers of artificial intelligence, and this is high on the agenda of our CEO, Stefan Oschmann, at Merck, but also as his presidency of FPA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry. You've heard from Thomas what um, digitization has done to the media, to the retail, to the transportation industries. And now, digitization is fundamentally changing the health sector. Although I must admit, Thomas, I haven't used uh, online dating yet. Uh, this may, this may uh, make me a, a hopeless analog romantic in that respect. But um, the change is now approaching healthcare faster and more profound than we ever would have thought possible even 10 years ago. And it carries great promise. What I will do now with all the elegant speeches in the past, I will iterate for the lack of a voice recognition algorithm that eliminates redundancy. I will iterate real time from my manuscript and try to leave out passages that have already been shared in a more elegant format and focus really on our genuine contribution as the pharma industry. Let me start with one example. The Human Genome Project was conceived in 1987 and started in 1990 as a public-private consortium of the best and brightest minds in biology with the intent to sequence and decipher the human genome. Now, it took 10 years to complete that, and ultimately the race was won by a company named Celera Genomics using high-powered computing power and laboratory mass quantitative analytic methods, but also data previously published by the public and private consortium. 10 years to sequence the human genome. Now how long would you think it takes today, 2017, to sequence the genome of one entire human? Would anybody venture a guess? Excellent, congratulations. Uh, one hour is the latest status uh, from, from Illumina published in February of this year. The cost has dropped to well below $1,000 and it will approach probably a few hundred dollars. Now you can imagine what opportunities that brings. And as a result, whole genome sequencing is now standard of care in the most advanced oncology centers around the world. And it's standard clinical practice to have tumors and genomes sequenced as part of standard routine clinical care. Now imagine the amount of data, three million base pairs, right, per human genome, from just one patient and then having thousands of patients in a tumor data bank with their genome sequenced. Unspeakable opportunities but also challenges. 
The pharmaceutical industry creates enormous value for patients around the world. And thanks to innovative medicines, people live longer, healthier lives, and more productive lives than ever. Let me give you just a few examples. Starting from the year 1990, which, by the way, was the first year I started as an intern in the clinic, not knowing much at all, mortality in the acute coronary syndrome has dropped by 65%. That's about 2.5% mortality reduction per year. We see long-term survival in many, if not the majority, of cancers, and HIV has been transformed from a universal death sentence to a chronic disease with near-normal life expectancy in most countries. Digital innovation in healthcare is much more than smartphone apps and um, wearables. And in fact, we need to separate data noise from genuine patient-centric value, which is, I believe, one of the key challenges. This will significantly improve the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease and deliver enormous benefits to the patient. The aim is then to better link individual steps in the value chain of healthcare. For instance, schedule individual doctor appointments, as we've heard, and coordinate the administration of medicines as an integrated part of the treatment cycle. Another example, machine learning will digitally enhance our diagnostic capabilities, for example, in multiple sclerosis. And uh, about a week from now in Paris, we will be awarding an innovation award to an amazing group uh, from Texas that has defined a machine learning algorithm to help the development of artificial intelligence to detect early inflammatory changes in the brains of multiple sclerosis patients, allowing earlier detection. And as we heard before, liberating the diagnostic capabilities of radiologists for actual patient care. So it's not a vision for the future. AI is here, and it's growing rapidly. Now, it is essential for all the available data to be linked, to be linked securely, and to use it rationally as the source of our innovation. So the value chains we are familiar with in the healthcare system will change significantly. Right before our eyes, we're now witnessing what economist Josef Schumpeter has called creative destruction. We can see new powerful IT players are making their way into the market, founding subsidiaries which focus on health, using massive resources and capabilities in data analysis. They are approaching the problem from a completely different perspective. At the same time, they are investing heavily through their venture capital funds and startups in healthcare, biotechnology, and the life sciences. And in some countries, this impact has already been heard. We uh, learned from Barnau a couple of examples in the US. I'd like to just um, mention one example from China and leave out a few others, which um, is about the main search engine in China, Baidu, where patients are offered the direct opportunity to arrange an appointment with doctors and are forwarded to online consulting services. Similar, even larger offerings from Alibaba, China's largest online merchant. So, should we disrupt the disruptors? I believe that the established healthcare providers have to rapidly adapt to these new market participants and not so much view them as future competitors, but seek out cooperation, even partnership, deep and genuine collaboration, while at the same time aligning our own business model to the digital market environment. No change is no option. In pharma, we have deep knowledge of biology, deep knowledge of medicine, the regulatory environment, and we now have technological means that we would not have dreamed about just a few years ago. Think about our ability to analyze massive amounts of very heterogeneous data from scientific publications, clinical images, entire human genomes that have been sequenced, or patient-related outcomes. This ability to structure different, seemingly unrelated data sources 
is based on sophisticated integration algorithms, and we had Merck partner, for example, with Palantir, but you've witnessed um, very elegant and, and sophisticated players on, on this panel today with Thomas and, and Carla. So these abilities are crucial. For example, when it comes to target validation in oncology, which will help us, for example, to predict the efficacy of our new innovative therapy in immuno-oncology, which we are launching right now this year. In combination with our abilities to edit the human genome by means of simple and highly specific gene scissors called CRISPR-Cas9, and, and Merck is a global leader in discovering, identifying, producing, um, and distributing this technology, we can now cure rare monogenetic diseases by means of an elegant, highly specific genomic molecular intervention. And we've seen in the past month the first actual gene editing based therapy with CAR T cells being approved by the FDA in a certain form of pediatric ALL lymphoma, truly a breakthrough and, and a milestone. But digitization's impact on healthcare is much broader. With the help of meaningful data, patients will have more information to make empowered decisions. The patriarchal physician-patient relationship is changing. And this brings the opportunity that empower patients can carry larger responsibilities for their own health and um, attain better outcomes, which at the end of the day still needs to be proven by outcomes research. Physicians and caregivers are few, and we've heard this in developed nations and um, developing nations, this leads to problems of access. If, for example, in Africa, an efficient infrastructure for telemedicine would be available, it would be a huge step forward. In the end, technology, like any medicine, needs to be measured from the view of benefit risk. And ideally, the benefit should outweigh the risk if this intervention is to be approved. So despite all the enthusiasm and, and being responsible for patient safety at Merck, we cannot neglect the risks that we see today, and I believe it's essential, for example, at a forum like this, that we enter into a broad public dialogue in which key ethical, society, and political issues, such as privacy, data protection, can be debated. It's clear that the introduction of this transformative technology will dramatically improve the healthcare systems. And we've seen this debate, for example, in the use of, in, in the debate around data storage in German private health insurance cards and public health insurance cards. So preparing healthcare systems for the next wave of innovation is too large a challenge for any single actor. Um, I will leave out this particular passage and go directly to another example. The Big Data Initiative for Better Outcomes is a project on Alzheimer's disease, hematological malignancies, and cardiovascular diseases. And this is a wonderful model of an almost ideal partnership from academia, regulatory agencies, patient organizations, and our biopharmaceutical industry that have teamed up to lay the foundation of an integrated data environment. Among other things, they're developing consensual outcome measures to combine real-world evidence with randomized controlled clinical trial data. This is important, admirable work, and it's the kind of collaboration we need to establish. At Merck, we have launched lighthouse projects in the area of assisted reproductive technology, which affects couples trying to conceive and we have tailored very specific individualized solutions per couple to help these critical phases in life generate and conceive new offspring, which as you all know, is mentally and psychologically a major challenge. With progress in the regulatory environment, I'm, I'm sorry, with all this progress, the regulatory environment of today needs to adapt. We need to use our data more efficiently 
and readily. It has to be accessible, available, and we need to tackle the data silos that exist in our own companies as well as outside. And finally, we have to establish a bioethical foundation to make sure that we do the right thing at the right time. So at Merck, we have established the Merck Bioethics Advisory Panel, where a group of world-renowned bioethicists from broad fields of theology, um, science, um, molecular biology, and medicine, bioethics themselves, advise us on our approach to interventions into the human genome, uh, the use of stem cells, or fertility research. So we need to make a better case of how we approach the transformative potential of data in healthcare and become even faster in developing our medicines, which, as you all know, in immuno-oncology today, are typically improved as phase one studies, saving enormous time from previous, more traditional development models. Patients and the public have to understand that digital health holds great promise, but also that we are listening and that we are sensitive to their concerns and respect them. I firmly believe the pharmaceutical companies that will prevail in the future are those that are able to combine deep scientific understanding, their unique regulatory experience, their familiarity with physicians and patients, um, and their traditional R&D work with the passion and mindset of a startup and the speed and agility. And when um, our CEO and members of the board visited Silicon Valley about a year ago to get an even deeper understanding of the speed and agility, our CEO mentioned that um, Merck, which is the oldest pharma company in the world, um, is also a startup only uh, 350 years ago. So with that, I believe that culture change is one of the biggest challenges in organizations. And this is a challenge that's not about introducing new technologies or the next app or the hottest new system or the next iPhone X with facial recognition or whatever. It's about leadership. It's a cultural task and it's about genuine leadership in changing our mindset. Ladies and gentlemen, let me close. All over the world, we are currently experiencing a radical change in the healthcare industry. One final example. In Africa, we are leapfrogging decades of clinical research um, by involving physicians and forms and bureaucratic measures in um, monitoring adverse events in our clinical trials. We are using simple smartphone self-reporting technology um, that makes sense in Africa because patients don't have physicians nearby. They don't have administration and bureaucracy, but they do have smartphones. And these events are reported real time and are great progress um, that we're currently experimenting with. So to play a key role in the digital health market, we must be agents of creative destruction because the value change that have served us for decades are about to be replaced by something different that's much quicker and much broader. So, in summary, I hope I have convinced you of three simple thoughts. Progress in genomic medicine and digitization, digital health, is explosive and it's unprecedented. We believe that both fields, molecular genomic medicine and big data analysis, are strongly complementary and can open a door to cure even the most severe diseases. And finally, the pharmaceutical industry is uniquely positioned to succeed and to contribute to global health if we accelerate our cultural change into deep partnerships with governments, payers, the device industries, and the software giants. I look forward to your critique and feedback on this position. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, finishes our initial round of presentations. Um, I would like to now ask the members of the panel whether they want to make any comment on any issue that the other 
interventions have brought to them. Please. Is this on? Okay. In, in my personal observation here of the point of views that were shared is that there's certainly a convergence of the what we need to accomplish. It's about leveraging big data. It's about new mo models of collaboration. It's about redesigning certain elements of the economics and scaling progress. I think the how is really, really difficult. And, and, and we have to really contemplate the, the recipe that we've used in the past where innovation was really uh, incubated in the research soil and never really scaled up too, too much. Um, so for me, the, the good thing is we're getting an agreement and we're reaching a point where we're fully aligned on the what, but the how is still the major question mark. So one approach to this excellent observation, in my view, is to create confined spaces of innovation where traditional pharma companies and other more traditional companies can just experiment and just do things. Where failure, quick failure, quick experimentation, rapid learning, um, innovation engines is part of the culture, which then can be back translated into the larger organizations. And um, as you know, our industry has not, for historic reasons, um, had a lot of tolerance for failure. So this major culture change, to a certain extent, um, is well served in a small innovation um, circle. And that's what we're doing with our innovation. And in order to get there um, from the European Commission together with the pharmaceutical industry, we have actually launched this partnership. Uh, Dr. Hildemann had actually mentioned a project from it, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, and uh, where we are working uh, between uh, researchers, industry, and not just the pharma industry, but this partnership is open to the IT and other industries with, who aren't yet so much involved, but we have had a lot of discussions and we certainly would hope that we can still build on the experience we already have and expand this partnership. But so that is one of those uh, tools that we have to bring the relevant players together and uh, indeed experiment. Uh, and uh, I should also mention that indeed I think the regulators, uh, which in the pharma industry uh, as the most highly regulated industry in the world, um, I think are aware of this and are really ready to experiment if you think of all the different initiatives of the European Medicines Agency um, to really accelerate uh, the process um, with prime designation and all others. So there's really a lot happening in this space. I got another, <coughs> I got another point, please. I very much liked how you touched upon the point of prevention. And if you look at the prevention and the lack of um, advancement outside the hospital, right, even with healthy or chronic patients, um, in the past, it used to be a gap of technology, right? It was difficult to connect, home care was complicated, was not able to be done by these three um, sick patients. I think these days are gone. Right now, the main inhibitor is reimbursement, actually. If you look at it, 80% of the healthcare investments go inside the hospital. And we are probably, as an industry, part of the problem for lobbying for that for many years, but we came to a point where I don't think we can get a hold on many of the especially chronic diseases without a real shift in the reimbursement model. So my question also to the government representatives uh, here in the round, how can we join forces to address that? Thank you very much. When we speak about money, only the governments are, are called. So in, I would like to keep in mind the statement of Steve Jobs, I appreciate the idea of uh, making a beautiful marriage between technology and uh, biology. And after that, it is important to point out the importance of uh, a common political will, and we'll be next December in Tallinn to support the conclusions of the European Council. Uh, today and tomorrow, my team uh, is in Tallinn working with the technical teams of other countries in Europe. But the, the central point is uh, the ability to pay, the will to pay, and the capacity of paying. Because we have now 
the opportunity of using IT like the mainstream of the true reform of the health systems in Europe. Uh, regarding the difference between health systems in the, the north of Europe, the southern of Europe, all of the countries have problems of sustainability. And we are not in conditions to give everybody, every people, uh, every solution. So we must invest in promotion, literacy, um, self-care. And you, we must not have a, a problem or a complex in dealing with our partners from the industry, either the technology industry, either the pharmaceutical industry. We have worked a lot in Europe concerning the approach to the medical pharmaceuticals and the pharmaceutical products innovation in order to um, discover a way to sustainability. But the main message I will, I will retain from this World uh, Health Summit is we need to talk uh, each others in, in these in this matters and we must have the courage to fix an objective, a strategic objective, considering that IT is clearly the solution. We have the tools, we have the means, it is on, only our responsibility to have the, the political will and um, to have the conscience that it is not possible to discover this new admirable new world that we are now facing without cooperation and uh, without uh, a, 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 a free and open talk like the, the one that we are now having. And uh, that is a solution. Considering the money, it's a problem, a global problem. And it is important that the Chancellor Angela Merkel and the, the President Macron is associated to the comprehension of new dimension of these problems. And I think our responsibility is to gather all the governments in Europe and the world, in the United States, to come in this trip with, with us because it is the strategic uh, trip for every humanity and humankind. Thank you very much. And, and I, may, if I may add one, one quick point as well. Sorry, Anna, it's just a quick, quick story here to bounce on this. I think there's another dimension as well to this paradigm. We certainly need to change the economics with, which fuel transformation, but, but the dimension that we're not talking about is the notion of healthcare moving slowly from a business to business to a business to consumer. And the patient being in the past a unit of production in a value chain to becoming the centerpiece. I'll give you one example that we can all relate to. I have two young kids, a daughter, seven years old, and a little boy. And living in Boston, America, I take them from time to time to one of these fast food chains. And the other day I was bringing my daughter, seven years old, and she said, well, daddy, I don't want to go there. They don't have good salads good salads. And what I'm trying to say here is that what we're seeing, the shift in the paradigm that we're not detecting, talking much about, is that slowly we're seeing a, the, the giant waking up. The patient starting to think about healthcare as a capital that can be managed as something that needs to be protected. And if we do our work well, and if we focus constantly on empowering the patient, the patient will move from the back seat to the front seat and really drive the change. Because government on their own can only lubricate a architecture of plumbing to basically allocate capital and balance the ecosystem. Technology players can only enable and propose some solutions, but patient can really steer it and demand progress, demand results, and demand change. So I think the patient has to be brought into the critical elements that will change the paradigm of healthcare. And I'm not talking 15 years out. I think it's happening now. Yeah, and, and to, to, add, to add to it, um, there is a fact that uh, we need to be extremely practical. Uh, data stands the chance when it's collected, uh, harmonized um, properly, stands the chance to actually fix issues today without a big need for policy changes. And this is what we can see at the World Economic Forum in a number of pilots in the field of value-based healthcare. The moment we start collecting data in a network of uh, community hospitals or multiple uh, network of hospitals and we start actually aligning on certain standards as we define the outcome in standards, uh, it stands the chance to actually create benchmarking and benchmarking and publications and communication to the external world, including patients, creates a natural competition 
whereby the variability of outcome that is very often in excess of 30 to 40 percent tends to reduce and then the cost would reduce. Uh, that's uh, proven uh, over and over and over since the 70s and the first publications of Michael Porter. So that's something that can be done practically today with little changes in, 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 uh, in policies. Now, when we go into uh, a more difficult topic that is about precision medicine, I think data will be only one of six dimensions. And data is absolutely critical, uh, but uh, the way we will make such that um, uh, data creates right evidence generation mechanisms, including from an economic standpoint. The way such evidence translates into clinical practice and don't stay on the shelves of academia or research centers, or, or, or how this is going to actually uh, impact the way regulatory frameworks are going to apply uh, new treatment protocols, how they're going to be redesigned, uh, not to even mention the bioethics implication of certain, some of such technologies and, and, uh, and, and the societal engagement that needs to happen uh, as a result. This is a much more complex pro problem, and I think this is really a one where, frankly speaking, absent of public-private collaboration, we are going to go absolutely nowhere, as evidenced by the multiple debates on the pricing for new cures that have emerged in the past two, three, four years. And guess what? Precision medicine, I would like to make the argument, is not happening. You've got two uh, cures uh, that are on the market, one of which being approved last week and the one from Novartis six weeks ago. I think all the limitations I've been mentioning before are not solely linked to data. I think um, that is precisely to the point of where the genuine strength of a pharma company that deeply understands the tumor targets, the tumor's mutational load, the tumor's biology, after sequenced therapies, um, can be paired up with big data analysis. And at the end of the day, the battle in oncology today is about combining traditional therapy with immunotherapy and ultimately genomic therapy. And if you consider a fraction of a percent of a given tumor type would respond to a certain therapy directed against a tumor antigen, it's clear that a clinical trial for this tumor will never happen because it's fiction. We will not find 0.3% of a tumor anywhere. So the classical design model of, of a clinical trial that we've used for decades is completely hopeless. So without a radical redesign of this clinical research in the molecular biology of, of tumor mutations, the future progress and reimbursement of this therapy will no longer be feasible. Well, uh, before opening the, to the questions from the floor, I would like to introduce a challenge for the members of the panel, myself. Well, I'm, I'm a computer engineer, which is striking enough is a bit of a rare species in this digitalization discussion. But still, I would like to bring something to the, to the discussion. I, uh, back in the 70s, when I was a student at university, I used punched cards to program. Some of you may have heard of those. Um, then things start, well, the first microprocessors appeared and so on. But there is certainly a very clear trend in all this. It's growing complexity. Things are ever more complex. We are also developing methods and mechanisms and processes to handle that complexity. But this, meant, this means that if I go to my health center in Portugal and the computer is down, nothing happens. While uh, when I went to the health center 20 years ago, the fact that the computer was not working was irrelevant. 
but I'm speaking about the place where it's very rare for the computer not to be working. But we are in the World Health, World Health Summit, and there are large, large parts of the world where almost no infrastructure is present. Um, I've seen in many countries, less developed countries, uh, where I can find lots of equipment and very, very few of those is working and for, usually for a very simple reason. There's no one to maintain it. So they buy it, it's a huge cost, huge transportation. Someone flies there from Europe or the States or wherever to put it to work, then flies back and in a few weeks it stops working and it's never put uh, to work again. And uh, so my question is, is this evolution towards digitization making systems more complex? I think it is, but there might be ways of handling that complexity. But above all, is this tendency for digitization of the, of the healthcare going to deepen the divide between developed and underdeveloped countries. Uh, we saw, yes, we heard yesterday a very strong uh, presentation by Yuan Liu, uh, Liu from the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, about, for instance, uh, Rohingya in, in, in Myanmar and, and Bangladesh. Uh, so th there's really a completely different world out there. Uh, is digitization going to help or to make things even worse? Actually, I would like to challenge you on your observation of, you know, large technology in developing countries not working because I can see within my own company, but also with competitors, that investment focus is shifting. One of our largest innovation centers is in Bangalore in India. I'm just coming back from Kenya last week, 92% um, mobile apps, and we have a large innovation center at site in Nairobi developing very specific mobile health tools for the conditions in that country. So I think there's a real significant change going on. And actually, I do believe that quite some developing countries are leapfrogging what we are doing in the States or in Europe right now in terms of mobile health technology. Yeah, I see the same phenomenon. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redact your challenge with a challenge as well. I think the notion of complexity of your toolkit is irrelevant. What's important is can your toolkit help you address more and more complex problems? Um, cloud technologies and the fact that you know, there's a new thinking of the code. The code is essentially becoming commodity. This is what's happening to IT. What matters is what you do with the code. Digital technologies allow you to deliver a certain value proposition at a fraction of the old on-premise cost. So it's neutralizing certain challenges economically. The underlying infrastructure that you need are leverageable in a very different models and completely agree with Carla. I mean, this is the, the new digital wave of technologies is recalibrating the balance between what it is to be modern versus not. You see countries closer to us like Estonia, what incredibly advanced in terms of digital technologies. I've had conversations with people in Colombia thinking about models that would be absolutely at the bleeding edge in Western economies in Europe. So what you're seeing as a risk is actually an opportunity. It's truly an opportunity. And you see what used to be, you know, developed economies trying to catapult themselves because they don't have to go through the same chronology. They just right away embrace, you know, bleeding edge digital solutions. And, and I think to your point, I think that's very true that in Africa we will find that some um, large imaging equipment are not in service and, uh, and, and you will find that in other uh, subsets of the industry that some of those technologies including IVD or diagnosis equipment is not being used. I think that's the trap when uh, we rely on um, uh, digital transformation in a way, but we don't uh, at the same time revise workflow and business models. Guess what? Uh, those nations have received ODA money by big chunks of ODA money for buying imaging equipment. They don't have a budget to maintain it. They don't have any money to do that. So 
can we find another way of doing business between the manufacturers and those very nations whereby that's going to be a service that's going to be uh, sold, that's going to be a managed equipment service that's going to be sold. Uh, and, 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 uh, and that will fall under uh, a more natural uh, resourcing model. The, uh, the, the other thing is that change of business model accompanying digital uh, but, uh, you know, we have seen examples of digital and virtual health uh, uh, like uh, uh, you guys are doing at Philips with community life centers being very, very effective, but they also involve a redefinition of the role of the workers, uh, whereby community life centers, uh, uh, community workers will from time to time replace a nurse or from time to time a nurse will do the job of a doctor. And when, and when uh, the workflow redesign is accompanying, is accompanying the uh, uh, digital transformation, uh, the chances of this to be effective are so much larger. Just to add to that, to my previous point about moving down from high acuity hospitals more into step down units and prevention, that's what's happening, right? In the community life centers, these are sometimes level one, level two hospitals really going in the community, partnering on a very local level very effectively. So I think actually Europe and the United States can learn from the way models, business models, including new commercial models are built up there. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would now like to open to the audience there's a lady down there. Hello, thank you for a great panel. My name is Sarah Ben Sharif. I'm a second year family medicine resident at McGill University in Montreal. And I'm going to premise, uh, preface my question by saying that I'm a big fan of digital technology. I used to drive Uber in medical school. I met my husband online, married him two months and four days ago. But professionally, as a physician, I find that my interactions with digital health are actually more serving of me. So in my day-to-day, -day, I find that using my EMR makes it easier to type my notes, access information. But anytime I've tried to engage my patients with digital health, it's fine. They collect their blood pressure measurements, they collect their blood sugars, but it never changes their behavior, ever. So my question to the panelists is, digital health is nice and all, but how do we use it to motivate patient behavior change? Thank you. Okay, let's just collect a couple more questions. To, there's one here up front. Well, too many anyhow, but let's go to this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ricardo Leita. I'm a member of parliament from Portugal. And I'd also like to greet uh, my minister, uh, president of this panel. Uh, I'd like to share with the panel and hear your comments on one concern and two comments on, on this field. One concern con is related to algorithms. Everyone talks about algorithms nowadays. They have been presented as black boxes. And as a member of parliament, I have tremendous concern of what goes on within them. And so. I believe that governments need to enforce industries to make sure that we are working with op open sources algorithms so we know what we're dealing with. And we can see the contrast, for, for example, between IBM Watson and Google DeepMind. A second comment is on data. Everyone's saying data is not the big issue. Having worked at the city level, I have to say that data is everything. We don't have data. And everything we're talking about depends on data. We have to develop tools that collect that data, possibly through a specialized agency that is capable of organizing all of that information, not only direct health information, but interconnected determinants information, so that then we can apply AI or augmented reality, or as was mentioned so importantly, outcomes-based financing models and predictive analytics towards prevention. Without that kind of uh, action, we will not be able to implement these these tools, and so we have to change the way we, we look at data donation as to compare it to blood donation, because data can save lives. And my last comment is on how digitalization can actually get people closer to one another. 
because I truly believe, as was mentioned, that at the step where we are at, information technology has pushed away healthcare professionals from their patients. But doctors now have this opportunity through the technology to have an assistant within that technology and to be able, through retraining of those healthcare professionals, of bringing back the humanization within healthcare so we can have more time as interface, as doctors, between technology and our patients, bringing back the heart into healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. One, one other question on that side. There was someone, please, in the, in the front row. Thank you. I'm Ben Bettigab, the Director of Science and Research of the European Resuscitation Council. Um, just one brief comment and question. Um, it was mentioned that mortality due to cardiovascular diseases, acute myocardial infarction and all this, was reduced by 65%, but it is needed to recognize that this is in-hospital mortality. The, the most important problem with these diseases is out-of-hospital mortality. So, for example, in so-called industrialized nations, cardiac arrest without successful resuscitation is the third leading cause of death after cancer and cardiovascular diseases of other origin. And it is very easy to help to increase the survival rates just by educating the people with the use of apps and with the use of just two hands to resuscitate. So lay resuscitation rates are much too low. And the question is, we will have a session at, at half past four down at, in America, in the room America. What can you, what can the industry do to help us here? Because this is a very low budget approach and we can save 100,000 of lives without, without any big, big new drugs or data or something like this. Thank you. So okay, let me respond let's, to... Let's start with this last question. Please, Stephen, yeah. Thank you. So, Wonderful critique of, of these statistics, thank you. I completely agree that for in-hospital mortality with acute coronary syndrome, we're approaching a threshold, quite frankly, where we, in the future, will not be in a position to improve this much further. And you are absolutely right. Nowadays, people die of heart disease outside the hospital. Once they reach it, even in an ongoing resuscitation, they will most likely survive, right? 94%. So people die outside the hospital. Prevention, therefore, um, is on multiple levels. Um, first, it is education on mobility, nutrition, and a healthy lifestyle. And fortunately, we're seeing incentives around that in some of the developing and developed nations. Secondly, I believe that there is a room for incentivizing good health habits in an ethical and responsible way. And that seems to be an opportunity we largely haven't explored. And finally, we've seen a number of examples of very low cost, almost generic medical interventions where well-established um, medications that went off patent decades ago um, are now adding incredible value at very little cost. And I will raise the example of metformin, which was discovered about 50 years ago um, you know, by ourselves and um, has been undergoing field-based, very simple preventive research in the setting of pre-diabetes, mostly in rural India, Africa, and the Arab world. And what we found is that we've been able to reduce the incidence of pre-diabetes, which for the most part will progress to fully blown diabetes, on the order of 30 to 40 percent. And this medication has been approved um, so far in more than 24 countries in this indication. And it's very, very low cost, literally generic medication. So I think there are different approaches to prevention and, and care, but thank you for the, for the question. So, <clears throat> also back to your question um, on cardiology mortality outside the hospital. As a very large AD and DFib producer, I see two changes happening which are really impactful. The first one, the research investment totally changing from the device into connectivity. 
really making sure that data is at the second we are there with the DFib is transferred to the hospital from the ambulance to the hospital continuous data flow. That's number one. The second thing is that business models change. We used to make money with selling devices. You have more and more cities coming up and Dubai is probably the leading one, but we see many. Tokyo is another one, but also in France and Germany coming up, talking about hard safe cities where we are not reimbursed about the number of AEDs anymore we provide, but on mortality rates and impact we provide. That's back to my previous point. Unless we start measuring, rewarding, and living up to the challenge of outcome, what you're rightly asking, I think, is not going to come, but especially in the area of ADs, DFIPS, there's really good progress. Well, I would like to, panel also to answer the other issues that were raised, namely the issue about the relation between the physician and the patient that is being too much interfered with by digitization and also the issues regarding the public control on algorithms and data and so on that was also raised, please. Yeah, on the, on the algorithms and the, and the, and the data, I, I think uh, there is no reason why regulatory systems should be less demanding on, uh, on algorithms than they would be on, uh, on drugs. That's the point I was making when I was standing there. I think the, 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 the demand for outcome, out, outcome measurement during the clinical trial moment should be identical and the classification uh, of the different uh, algorithms depending on what they're going to be used for uh, should, be, uh, should be also uh, identical uh, to, uh, to any other technology or solutions. Um, the, uh, I, and I think this is where, as opposed to trying to understand what's in the algorithm, because then you can question how is the data collected in the first place, or is this insufficient quality in the first place, you need to run that like a standard clinical trial and look at uh, uh, the, the algorithm being applied to make a clinical decision, decision. That clinical decision has an outcome effect on the patient and that has to be a randomized clinical trial, I think. Now, on, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the question of the data, I don't know that we miss uh, so much data. Actually, when 92% when of uh, hospitals in, uh, in mature economies have an EMR, they have data by definition. And, and what I find interesting is that uh, well, we've been working in Atlanta with uh, 40 systems, including Emory and Grady and so on. And we realized that those hospitals, even though we claim that there is a lack of interoperability, 80% uh, of what they measure is the same thing. Uh, and we were looking at that in the context of CHF, by the way. And those standards that they measure are in general the ones as defined by the American Heart Association or other forms of standards. The, 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 the question is, why is that that they don't compare and benchmark? That's, I think, what's very interesting. And that's where, uh, that's where you go more into behavioral economics and, uh, and the uh, positive incentives of actually uh, benchmarking. So I have to say I really enjoyed the question from our physician colleague, um, I believe from Canada, McGill, who um, you know, quite obviously is a very young, digitally well-connected and fully versed physician at one of the top universities. And what she's basically asking us is um, what's in it for me as a physician at the bedside? And I think this is a very valid question that we haven't fully answered yet. What is our value proposition for the physician-patient um, threshold at the bedside? And I remember one of my first presentations I heard on virtual colonoscopy, this was 20 years ago, um, when I asked my boss at the time what he thought about it. And he got up and, and asked the presenter and basically said to him, look, come back to me when you can do virtual polypectomy, right? and then we will speak. So I, I fundamentally think that the patient-physician interaction is a unique and special sphere. It will never be fully replaced by anything that's digital or purely data-driven. And that's not something probably we want to do. Like Carla said, most patients don't come to the physician saying, I want more 
asymmetrical data integrating algorithms. They want help with their disease. So I really think that for those of us sitting here, this is an area we need to explore further. We need to separate the value from the noise and come up with value propositions that are more sustainable and more concrete. We're just at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to make sure I, we answered the question completely, I also detected the notion of, or the question of how can I make sure that uh, when I give my patient a prescription, he's going to comply and modify his behavior for success. Um, well, you know, when I think there's fundamentally a gap in the quality of the experience that the tools, the IT tools, and remember, I come to the problem from the perspective of a technologist. You know, think about it. Sunday night, we use Netflix, we're on Facebook, you know, uh, WhatsApp, you know, any type of online dating tool, apparently. Uh, and then come Monday morning, you know, so it's a great experience, it's directly rewarding, it's very engaging, it's easy. And then Monday morning, we open the EHR. I go in, uh, in Excel and review the P&L. I mean, we have to bridge that gap, first of all, from an experience of the consumer, patient as a consumer. Whatever tools we give them um, in order to comply with a specific behavior that's expected has to be very good. And it all comes down to incentives, of course, right? Uh, now, we can't pay the patient to behave a certain way. I mean, certain experiments along these lines have been performed, but are difficult to scale in the short term. Um, I think the technology will not replace the privileged relationship and special relationship between the physician and the patient, but it has to extend it. Right now, that relationship is like taking a picture, and then you don't, you're disconnected, you're alone at sea, and then you come back to see your physician. Technology has to, to be leveraged to create an ongoing dialogue where you have as a physician and if, um, if your patient is, is taking a certain medication, you have the tools to monitor whether the patient is taking the medication. You have the tools to see how the biomedical uh, information are evolving. And if you detect somewhere that there's a problem, you can call the patient back. You can reach out without having the patient come and see you. So it's really extending this moment in time to an ongoing dialogue. I think this will be part, at least, of, of one dimension of the solution here. I think you also had the question of um, apps outside the hospital and that not really impacting patients' behavior and your frustration about that. Um, I think there are three cases. There are apps which work very well and where you get really good measurable feedback. For example, in COPD, we have quite some positive experience, right? There are others that don't and we are um, currently scanning the market also with our partners and startups on cardiology and um, um, dietary changes to impact health diseases. And while there are millions of apps, the proof points are pretty thin, right? And I would just say from a hospital perspective, if whoever provides you with these greatest newest tools, unless these change of behaviors can be really measured and proven, there should be no way for any hospital to pay for that or to engage for that. That's my point on outcome. But I think there's also a third point, and that is about willingness of a patient. And sometimes we are just overestimating what a patient should want. And we see that with smoking, right? Everybody in the industry think it should be so obvious and everybody should really want to change their lifestyle about it. I think in the end, each individual has the right to say no, has the right to say, hey, listen, I'm 85, I smoked all my life, and guess what? I'm going to continue now, and I don't want your digital apps. And there is also this point of self-determination in the end, which we as the industry have to respect. Okay. Uh, I think this brings to the end our uh, session. Uh, I would like to thank uh, very strongly our panel members. I think it has been a very interesting session. We, uh, I certainly have learned a lot regarding what we can expect from digital health. And I would like to ask you to join me in a round of applause for our members of the panel.